All right, glad to have you this morning. Again, are you ready to get into the Word? We're on our series called Inside Out Living, and we've been on this for a few weeks now, and Lord willing, I believe this is going to be the last week of our, of our series, so I'm going to try and get as much in in this last one as I could. So if you take a moment, get your Bibles out, open up your version Bible out, up if you'd like for the sermon notes, or pull your sermon notes out of your worship guide. Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, inside out living, we're living from the inside out, not the outside in. I hope this has been a blessing to you so far. I hope it's helping you and helping you in all areas of your life. We've been talking about, we based it off of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You remember where we talked about though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. So we understood there's an outward man which is our natural us, or this is our earthly part of us, our feelings, our body, our natural part. And then we also have an inner man. And when I say man, it's your inner part, your spirit being. So we have an earthly part of us, and we have a heavenly part of us. So on the earth, we have access to both earthly impact and heavenly impact. Heaven to us working through us to the earth. So we have inner man and an outer man. So we've been talking about that and it's our our understanding or it's our desire for us to grow in our relationship with God. I think this is vitally important for us to understand fulfillment, why we're here, for us to grow in the relationship of the partnership between our outer man and our inner man working together. My outer man has a value, has a purpose. My inner man has a value and has a purpose. And our goal is to have them working together in partnership. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to talk about growing out of us on the inside everything that God's put in us. And that's going to be our emphasis for today. So Galatians chapter 3, have you found it yet? All right, we're going to start reading together in verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. And it says here, says that we are all, for, we, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now that word sons is a, a Greek word that just means offspring, means a kind or class of persons possessing certain derived characteristics. For we are all sons or daughters, it's not gender specific, We are all offspring of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But when it says we're sons and daughters, notice what I said. It's having the characteristics, some of the derived characteristics of the person you are offspring from. So in the natural, most of you, if you understand your natural parents, you have some characteristics, some genetic makeup, some of your looks, some of it that comes from your parents. My children have some of my characteristics. Some they're proud of, some they're not so proud of. But they have some things that came from me. They had no say-so, it just came from them because they're my offspring. So now I got some things from my parents. Certain things I look like some of my parents. Some parts about me looks like my parents. It's just it came from them because I'm born from them. You ready? It says that you're also sons and daughters of God. So when we get born again, the good part is I don't just have the characteristics of my earthly parents. I also have the characteristics of my heavenly parents. When I got born again, I got the derived characteristics of heaven put on the inside of me. There are things that just I just got by being born again. I was born of the Father, so I just got the characteristics of the Father put on the inside of me. Now we just got to learn how to bring them out. I got some characteristics from, from David on the inside of me sometimes, my natural father. And sometimes I got to keep them from coming out. But some things I got to let them come out. Because some things are good from our parents. Some things we got to learn from our parents. So we just got to figure out that balance. Are you tracking with me this morning? So we're sons of God through faith. But here's what I want to emphasize. I want, I want to pull out this little uh, illustration. At first I said I was going to start shooting giant spit wads to the crowd this morning and I <laughs> wanted to relive 10-year-old Chad, but I decided not to do that this morning. But here, this tube, when it says that we are all sons and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus, through, every word of your Bible is important. And I want to show you how one word 
can make a big difference in understanding the scripture. Through, that word through is a Greek word dia. You got it in your sermon notes here. And it means they, a channel of an act or something that if something flows through. So when you say through something in the Bible, usually it's something that something flows through. It's a channel. So I have this golf ball. And I want you to show, I wrote on here, faith and patience. We'll need that in a moment. On the other side, I've got works. And so what this means, through faith, we're sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Let's go, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says this. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God. Not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So now, here's what I mean by this, and it's really important for how we understand how things need to work in the kingdom. Things come through faith. So notice what it says. By grace are you saved through faith. By. By, that word, means who originates it. By grace. and means it comes from God. So through faith is how it gets to me. By grace is who decided to give it to me. By grace, by puts the ball in the tube. The tube is how it gets to me. Here's what I want you to understand. Theologically, we need to make a distinction between by and through. There's two ditches that I've found in Christianity that we can get into. The Bible says by grace. In other words, it comes from God. It's a gift from God. Salvation did not come from us. We didn't originate it. God did it was his idea. It was his plan. He did it. It's all from God. But how does it get to me? It gets to me through faith. I didn't come up with it, but I have to be a part of receiving it. So here's the difference. Two ditches we can get in. If you want to take the faith message too far, you can begin to think that it's by faith. You can begin to be convinced that my faith causes it to happen. My faith does not twist God's arm. I need to help you take some pressure off your faith. Some of you are so discouraged because you think my faith's not enough, therefore God won't do it. It's not by faith, it's by grace. It's a gift of God. It's God's idea. It's by God through faith. So salvation was God's idea, but how it comes to Chad is through faith I receive what he chose to give me. So I point it towards me, he puts the ball in, I get to receive it through my faith. But here's the other ditch. So one ditch is you can think it's by your faith, but the other ditch is that some people will begin to believe that it's through grace. It's by grace, God's idea, but it's not through grace. Through grace leads me to believe that it's none of my responsibility. It's all God's decision. Little words in scripture help you with your theology. It's by grace. Absolutely it comes from God, but it's through faith. It's not by grace and through grace. God originated it, his idea, but you and I are the ones who have to apply our faith to receive it to ourselves. Does God want everybody to be born again? I believe he does. Some don't believe that, but I believe God wants everybody to be saved. I believe that he, when he says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But how does it come to you? It comes to you not because God says, bam, you're saved. It comes to you because you receive it through faith. So you need to understand that. You need to let yourself realize that it's not by faith. It's not that if I can just believe harder, then God will be impressed and want to do it. You don't change God's will. You agree with God's will. 
You're not rewriting the Bible. You're just agreeing with the Bible. <laughs> Whoa, man, you got to get a hold of that. It's by grace. It's God's plan, but it's through faith. So there's a reason I said that. He says, we're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. So he gets rid of ethnicity issues here. No, Jew nor Greek. It's not about where you come from. There's neither slave nor free. He's letting you know that slavery is not uh, valid. He's, he's condemning slavery. There is neither male nor female. Now he's getting rid of discrimination and holding one gender above the other. Come on, somebody. He's leveling the playing field for everyone. That in Christ, look what he says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. No matter your color, no matter your background, no matter your ethnicity, no matter your gender, we are all on the same playing field in Christ. Our nation needs to grasp a hold of the truths of God's word. So this is what he's saying. You're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, so this is if you are born again, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart and allowed him to cause your inside to be made new through Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now look at this verse 29. You are Christ. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. An heir. Here's what an heir is. Look at your, your notes there. The word heir means a right to receive something. An inheritor. A possessor. If you are an heir, it's not something that you did on your own. You can't make yourself an heir. Somebody has to do it for you. You can't call up Steve Jobs or Oprah Winfrey, and say, hey, I'm going to be your heir. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Now they can call you up and say, hey, you know what? I've heard about you, and I've decided to put you in my will. You are now an heir. Someone on the giving end can decide. Something on the, end, on the receiving side just has to receive it. There's a lot more to say right there, but just, just accept the fact that you're an heir of God, so God did something for you you couldn't do for yourself. You're an heir of God, so notice what it says, for we are, uh, if you are Abraham's seed, then heir, so an heir according to the promise. Now here's what the word promise means, you're an heir according to what? So do we, what do we inherit? We're an heir according to the promise. Here's what we are not. We are not heirs according to our preferences. Much to my chagrin, eighth grade vocabulary word, we are not, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Grubb, we are not, we are not an heir of our preferences. We are an heir of the promise. What is the promise? Here's what I gave you there in your notes. The word promise there is really important. It's twofold. The word promise there means the content of what is said, some, a statement made, it's a promise made, it's something that I say, I promise. It's the actual verbiage of what I commit to do. That's a promise. But there's another side of the promise that it's more than just what I say, it's also actually getting to partake of what was said. Let me give you an example. I can promise my kids that we're going to go to Cold Stone for ice cream. And that statement is a promise. If I say, hey, I promise that I'm going to take you to Cold Stone. Shameless plug right there. So now I've given them a promise. But, 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 if it's just that I said it and they never eat the ice cream, did they receive the promise? They heard words and the words were good. The words were true. But the word of God to you, the promise of the word, is not just the statement that it's a fact, it's also the promise of fulfillment. In other words, I don't want to just tell you it's possible, I want to do it. So you are an heir of the promise, but here's the problem. Sometimes we fall short and we get satisfied with the invitation to Cold Stone instead of pushing through until we eat the ice cream. Because we're an heir of the promise. So, so you might, okay, so how do I eat the ice cream? That's a great question. Because one of the things that's very important to me, and I've just been going over some things and praying about certain things, I don't want you to just be inspired on a Sunday. 
If we just inspire people on Sunday, but we don't inform them for Monday, then you come in and get a spiritual high and you're hoping you will survive until next week. I want to give you information that you can apply to Monday. So if I say, hey, we are heirs of the promises, that sounds like a great churchy phrase, but it means nothing to us unless we know how to use it. So when the Bible talks about the promises of God, it's talking about everything that God said in here we can have, we have a right to it. So how do you inherit the promises? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Let me give you a scripture. Hebrews chapter 6 says this, that you do not become sluggish. That word sluggish just means lazy. That you do not become sluggish or lazy, or it also means slow to become involved or understand. Do not become sluggish, but imitate or mimic, ready? Who are we supposed to mimic? Those. Your Bible is getting ready to tell you who you're supposed to imitate. Mimic these. Mimic these people. Mimic those who through, here's that word through again, through faith and patience inherit the promises. Are you an heir? You're an heir, so you have been promised ice cream. You've been promised whatever you need. I'm using ice cream just because everybody loves ice cream. Not everybody loves ice cream. If you don't, never mind. So not everybody likes <laughs> I just let that run around the track. So, but notice what it says. Imitate those who through faith and patience. So what is it by? The promise of this word, see this golf ball has the word promise on there. You can't see it, but it has the word promise. So the promise, how does it get to me? It gets to me by grace. In other words, it's not my idea. It has to be according to the promise of God, not my preferences. I have to find in the scripture, which is a promise of God, what he wants to do for me, not what I want him to do for me. Let me try over here. For you to apply it. This is why we need to know the Bible. Because I don't go to God and I tell him what I want him to do for me. I find what he wants to do for me and I receive it through faith. That way I don't have to wonder if it's his will or not if he wants to do it. If I find it in the Bible, then he's telling me, Sure, I I want to do that for you. That's what he's telling me. I'm not sure what was in that pipe, but that didn't smell very good. So now, PVC pipe, you never know. But notice. (laughs) Imitate who? Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What's the word faith? The word faith means to believe according to something and then act according to how you believe. So if you believe something, it should change your actions. If it does not change your actions, you don't believe it yet. Let me illustrate it. All right, Black Friday just happened not too long ago, shoppers. You remember when maybe, and they don't do it as much anymore, but you know, they send those ads in the paper, you know, for Black Friday. Now it's like, what, Black Thursday? They start like two o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is that they send these ads to you in the newspaper of what the prices are going to be. And you read those words on those ads. And if you believe those words, that they're going to sell that TV to you regularly, $1,900, but they're going to sell it for $200 starting at 2 o'clock in the morning. If you believe what those words say on that ad, you will get yourself up at 1230 in the morning to drive an hour, to stand in line an hour because you believe that that TV is going to be sold to you for $200. Your actions supported what you believe. Do you get up at 1230 in the morning and drive an hour to wait in line just normal? Is that a normal part of your day? No, your actions changed. Why? Because what you believe changed. And what caused you to change what you believe? Words. 
Words from Target caused faith to arise in you. (laughs) Right? Words from Best Buy causes faith to stir. And you believe, and therefore you act. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. But that's an illustration. If God said something, put words on a page... Why doesn't his words on the page change our actions to agree with what he said? Too many times we have more faith in Best Buy than we do the creator of the universe. And I'm not hating on anybody. I'm just using a common illustration so we can understand through faith, what does it mean? Through faith means I'm going to start acting according to how I believe. Because you'll take that ad and you'll show up at the door. They haven't even unlocked it yet. And you're like, here I am. Let me in. I believe there's a TV in there for $200. Got my name on it. And you'll even take your ad because you go and you get your TV. You're waiting in line. Right? You're waiting in line. And and you bring the ad with you. Why? Your action's faith. You'll bring the ad with you because you get up there and the cashier says to you, "Uh, that'll be uh, $1,900, please. You'll be like, oh, no. No. What do you do? Hang on. I got something for you. I got a piece of paper here. And you'll take that ad and you'll let it out. Bam. Right here. It says, it says, you promised... You promised that you would sell it to me for 200 So according to what you said, because then you'll best buy up here at the top. You said, I will hold you to your word. Well, this is what God's saying. He's saying, bring my ad to me. Bring, your, bring my ad. I'm not writing the ad. I'm not making up what I want, but I'm bringing his ad. And I'm saying, wait a minute. I've got an ad for that need right here. Here's a promise of the word of God. Now, Lord, I thank you. I receive it through faith. It's not by my faith that I'm making God do something that he doesn't want to do. It's by grace he put the promise into the word and I just lined up with the ad and said, I'll receive it. Thank you very much. This is what God's wanting us to do. This is how he's wanting us to operate. So when we work that way and we understand what he's doing, this is who we're supposed to imitate. We're supposed to imitate those who do it that way. It doesn't say imitate those who by the luck of the draw, God just happened to smile on them and give something because he likes them better than you. That's not what it says. Imitate those who through faith and patience, (laughs) patience, 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 patience. Why? See, because faith and patience, what's patience mean? Patience means that I will not quit until I see the manifestation of what he's promised me. Patience is I will keep nagging mom and dad until they finally take me to Cold Stone. It's not, it's not an insult to me if my kids keep reminding me of my promise. If I promise my kids something and they come up and they say, Dad, you promised to take us. Well, shut up, you greedy little bugger. <laughs> I, if I promised it, then why am I going to be mad at them when they bring me my ad? God's not going to be mad at you when you bring him his ad that he wrote for you. Well, I just don't know. I feel a little bit, you know, like I just demanding God. No, it's his ad. Bring it to him. Best Buy will not be complaining to you when you bring their ad. They'll say, well, here we go. I'll be glad to give that to you for $200. But too many people are not believing the ad, so they never go to the store, and they never get the TV that they could get just like anybody else through faith and patience. But the problem with patience is sometimes you don't know how long the tube is. (laughs) it's like it's coming it's coming you're looking in the tube where in the world is it god you coming but here here the other side of this tube is works and the problem is 
If we try and receive something through work, works is us trying to earn it or deserve it. How's it written? There it is. Works. But if we try to put it in there by works, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. It's not of us. So this is what God's wanting us to do. For us to inherit our promises, everything that God wants to give us, we gotta understand how we've gotta get that promise to us. Now look what it says in chapter four. So your heir, your Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise, but here's a good part. Verse, verse one of chapter four. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Look at the two people that are being compared right there in your scripture. The heir and the slave. The heir, as long as he is a child. That word child is the same word that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter three, a babe of, in Christ, immature Christian. Immature, not able to speak yet, not understanding, still drinking milk. That's what they're talking about. The heir, as long as they're a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Now, when you see the word slave, I don't want you to get caught up in racial differences or put a picture in your mind. This slave, he was writing to people that had slaves, but he was not saying it was okay to have slaves. He had just said two verses earlier that in Christ, there you're neither slave nor free. And so don't read the word slave, and so that's not me, because I'm not from, you start talking about a racial thing. It's not about that. Look what the word slave means. This is really important. The word slave in the Greek means bound, a state of being controlled by someone or something subservient. So you could say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a slave to anything. Are you bound by anything? Are you controlled by anything? <laughs> Are you controlled by something? If we're controlled by something, then we're a slave in that area. Now listen, when you hear these terms, don't hear broad brush stroke. Here's the, here's the problem. Here's sometimes why we have trouble relating to scripture, because we hear in broad brush strokes. In other words, am I a slave? Nope, I'm free in Christ. And you blow it off and God says, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not talking about overall. I could be talking about just an area. Because I can be an heir of God and walk in the freedom of what God has for me in this area of my life and still be bound in another area. Yes, yes. Come on. I can be bound to insecurity. Come on. I can be bound to the opinions of people. I can be bound by what other people think about me. I can be bound by addiction and still have freedom in other areas of my life. So we all need freedom in some area of our life. This scripture applies to us all. Don't think, well, I'm not slave. Oh, there's areas of my life I need freedom. I recognize that. I'm praying into that. I'm saying, God, I don't want to be a slave in any area of my life, so I want to accept the freedom that you've given me. But look what it says. An heir... As long as he's a child, does not differ from the slave. Heir, right to an inheritance. Slave, no right to an inheritance. Just in context, it's what they're comparing. But the heir, as long as they're an immature Christian and does not know, notice what it says, the heir, as long as he is a child, Will, will, does not differ from the slave, even though he is master of all. Now look, I put this down. That word master of all just means supreme in authority. So as long as they're a child, they're born again, but they're still bound. They're a babe in Christ. They're out of Egypt, but Egypt's not out of them. We can be born again and still have a bunch of issues. Can somebody relate with me? See, we can still, once we get born again, we still have to transform ourselves by renewing our mind. We can be out of Egypt and still have Egypt in us. In other words, I can be out of the world but still think worldly. So now this is what he's saying. The heir, check this out. The heir, as long as they are a child and they don't know or understand their freedom in Christ, will live within the same boundaries and limitations as others and become a servant to things they should be a master over. Do you grasp that? 
See, what happens when we're an heir, as long as we're immature, this is what we're talking about growing in our relationship with Christ, inside out. As long as we are a child and immature in our belief and our faith in Christ, we will live the same way. We will live in the same bondage as other people who don't even have freedom because we're not accessing the freedom that's available to us. And this is what God's telling us. He said, listen, you're an heir. You're a son or daughter of God. Stop living in bondage to things I've told you that you're master over. So he said that he is the master of all. Read that there in your Bible. It says that even though he is the master of all, it doesn't say he might be the master of all. It doesn't say he could be the master of all. It means he is. Ready for this? What we is may not be what we experience. I know I'd made bad grammar there, but I did it on purpose. Sometimes it's not on purpose. That time it was on purpose. (laughs) What we is in Christ is not always what we experience. He's an heir, but because he's a babe, he's living like a slave. Prodigal son, eating trash with the hogs, but he's an heir. His lifestyle doesn't match his inheritance. How many of us, our lifestyle's not matching our inheritance? I'll raise my hand. There's areas of my life that my lifestyle's not matching my inheritance. God has made more available to me than I'm accessing. So I wanna grow in that. So he's telling us, listen, See, the flip side is also true. We can also experience something that we are not. This is when people are living a life that's not their identity. I have time to go into that. They're bound by things they should be a master over. Look, let me go ahead, read here, verse two. But as under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. When When we're born again, here's what happens. I want you to understand what's available to you. Let me, let me get to it. Go to verse three. Even so we, when we are children, we're in bondage under the elements, under the principles, under the nature of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your outer man or inner man. Inner man, inner man, because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your inner man, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, because of this, you are no longer a, you're no longer bound, but you are a son or daughter. And if a son or daughter, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. Now check this out. When we're born again, you come into a relationship with God as a child or as a baby in our understanding. But in our inheritance, we come full. When we're born again, everything that Jesus died to make available to us is available to us. We're an heir to everything. But as long as we're a child, we won't experience everything. Let me read this scripture. Uh, let, 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 let me read that scripture. I don't have time for that. Let me, use, let me use a way to illustrate this as we close. In Genesis chapter one, verse 11, I'm getting excited about this. The Bible says, you have looked this up on your own, that God created a system where a seed produces after its own kind. Man, you need to get this. A seed produces after its own kind. And it talks about creating a fruit whose seed is in itself. What that means is that the seed stage, and this blew my mind, I've preached about seed so many times in the last many years, and I'd never seen this this way before. But God said the seed stage, when you have a seed, farmers, gardeners, That seed is both the beginning stage, we got that, but it's also the fulfillment stage. I said, no, 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 it's not the fulfillment stage, that's when you harvest. He said, no, 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 no. He said, Chad, you're thinking within time. 
I don't think within time. Why is it both the, why is it both the beginning stage and the fulfillment stage? It's the fulfillment stage because everything that seed needs is already on the inside of it. I'm not a gardener. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't have a green thumb, but I appreciate the process. That seed, as the growing process happens, you never have to inject anything into the seed to cause it to produce something. Everything is already in it. It just has to grow. It has to develop. <laughs> I put this part down. This was so good. I said, Lord, that's amazing. But he said, in the seed, everything is contained, but not everything is revealed. Everything is contained, but not everything is seen. Everything. A seed possesses everything internally that it needs to produce something externally. Everything it needs to grow tomatoes is inside that seed. But it's got to be released. So here's, here's what else. The seed has to grow in order for everything to be seen or experienced externally that is deposited internally. Check this out. It's an internal deposit that requires an external release. Everything's in a seed, but at some point, something has to break out. Nothing breaks in a seed to cause it to grow. It breaks out. You are the seed of Abraham. What's in you needs to break out. Everything you need is already there. It just has to come out. But we've got to change the way we think. We pray this way, God give me. God give me. I'm just praying for God to give me. But if God is in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Christ is in me, then everything I need is in me. I don't need to ask him to give it to me. I need to release it. I need to grow it. What am I growing? I'm growing him. If he's in you, then everything you need. Your inheritance, my inheritance, it's in me. Do I see it all? No. But you don't see everything that's in that seed either. But you still plant it and you plan on eating maters off of it. Well, just because you don't see the fullness of what God has promised yet, don't quit growing. Even as a child, even take human beings, the moment that that sperm and that egg come together, that moment that embryo, everything that's needed is available. In that second that they come together, everything that person needs to run a marathon is already there. Can they run a marathon? <laughs> no. Everything that they need to run a business, it's there. Every idea, every thing that needs to come to them to be the parent, to be the child, everything they need, it's available. When I'm growing different stages, they didn't take off my shorter legs and put on longer legs. My legs just grew from within. They didn't take off my arms at state, and when I'm two years old, they say, oh, you're going to need longer arms when you're three and four. It was already in me. They didn't put bigger feet on me. My feet just kept growing. They didn't open up my brain and put a bigger brain in me for a different stage. I just developed and it got bigger as I grew. Everything you need from God is in you. We just gotta grow it. We gotta develop it. We understand that in the natural. But we got to see this is what God's wanting to do in our life. Everything that we have, we have to develop from within. The seed is producing. So let me ask you this. Is the seed, is that tomato seed, is it really producing something? Or is it just releasing something? Who 
produced it? God. God made the seed. Put the seed in the right environment and the seed will release what's in it. It's by grace, folks. Everything that we have comes from God. Every good thing you see about me, it came from God. But it will not be released out of me without my participation. I will not experience everything. There's an internal deposit that needs an external release. And my heart for you my heart for myself and us as a church is that we will grow from the inside out. The love you need for that person, it's within you. I know that this is the way you want to pray. God, you're going to have to give me some love for that people. Guess what? He's already put it in there. I need some patience for these kids. Dang it! I just want to help you. Your patience doesn't need to be given. It needs to be grown. It's already in your garden. Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know that wisdom you need? It's already in you. Everything you need. Does it come from you? No, it comes from God. But it's Him on the inside of you.